Hey everyone, how are we all doing tonight? Thought I'd do a little live editorial for everyone. Love this song. Blood and Fire. It's one of the greatest activist songs ever written from the Reiki era. Just uh, Blood and Fire. Anyway, what I want to talk tonight is, uh, well, first of all, just let's get down to the business. I'm rolling up some nice nugs. Got some nice nugs getting rolled up. Infused nugs. I'm rolling them with live resin and honey oil. So we're doubly infusing them. And uh, we're going to have a little one-on-one uh, -on -one powwow between you and me. And the real history and the background and this, what's going on with medical cannabis and this non-medical cannabis in Canada. This uh, commonwealth. And uh, we're going to talk about it. Uh, seriously tonight and uh, but first I wanted to you know do a little bit of incense you know and um, you know a little bit of smudging to all my you know to all my all my relations and uh, this wonderful place that we call British Columbia all the benefits we get of living here in a natural beautiful temperate rainforest it's just incredible Medicinal plants everywhere around us still. world hasn't ruined it yet. Anyway, let me get down to business. Okay, so I want to start with a little bit of background. For all of you that might know this, great. If you don't, you know, let's catch up. I'm going to cover the timeline real quick of um, cannabis law in Canada. So how it works here in Canada is we're a common law country, which means courts determine what the policies or what legislation will be and the courts continue to refine and correct them when legislation get out of constitutionality and they continue to bring them back and that's what it's called so let me start this all started not that long ago i know it seems like it was but for us medical patients back in the 90s and 80s we were suffering pretty hard and really struggling without access to something that wouldn't put us in jail so July 31st, 2000 rolls around and uh, Parker, R versus Parker case goes down. A uh, fellow named Terry Parker uh, who had a very severe form of epilepsy and basically he's, um, uh, the conventional treatments and surgeries were not working and he had to have, um, he had to have cannabis and uh, he was growing it and charged once and twice and on the second decision, um, the first one was July 31st, 2000, where uh, on that day, prohibition against possession for medical marijuana was declared unconstitutional because it violated Section 7. But then later on, in July 30th of 2001, the government finally rolled around with its first program. Well, I should say the Section 56 application program was how we all got in the door originally. But then they started a program in two March, sorry, July 30th, 2001 called the medical marijuana access regulations or the mmar that and which permitted possession for license with your license to health canada you could possess or grow cannabis for yourself or if you're designated for another person and uh, or you could purchase from at the time the government had their own licensed producer called plant prairie systems growing in a mine in flim Flon, manitoba and um, that was what they wanted everyone to use and just like uh, you know, uh, history repeating itself. But anyway, um, that didn't uh, didn't work out, of course. In the end, the, they really didn't do a good job of supplying and they, they lost the contract. So let's move ahead to July 2003. Uh, finally, they started offering their marijuana and seeds for sale by their government, you know, by the government supplier. Again, it keep go ahead by October 2003, the MMER prohibition the dps couldn't be compensated or grow for more than one person or more than two growers could grow together was held unconstitutional that was the hitsick decision 
Then came December 3rd, 2003, where the MMER uh, was, and it regulates the designated per person can be compensated and grow with two others, allowing three per site was allowed. And these kind of, and as you can see, this kind of went on and on, January, February, restrictions, cases, restrictions, cases, trying to craft a law that was legal. And of course, in the end, the government didn't really care about what we were trying to do through the courts, including one of my own cases, the Carlisle versus the Queen. And uh, <laughs> come along uh, February, uh, June, sorry, June 7th, 2013, the government offers another program called the MMPR, the Medical Marijuana Production Regulations. And this one basically said that now you're going to take only their weed and that's it. And they were going to start to clamp down on medical marijuana. That was their plan. And so a lot of us patients who thought that was just a bunch of BS, we got together and we raised the money and we did an injunction against that specific regulation, which was known as the Allard Injunction, which was February 24th, 2016. And it was held that the MMPR itself was completely unconstitutional and the government was instructed to go ahead and create another program that was constitutional and they created one called the ACMPR, the Access to Cannabis Medical Production Regulations. They keep going with these wonderful names. And in that, basically, it permitted derivatives and other forms of cannabis and whatnot. But of course, it still didn't have, in this whole time, as you can notice, Medical patients were given no actual supply covered by medical services that they could access under their disability income sources. That never existed. So with 2000, July 30th, 1st of 2000 till, I'm going to go till all the way to now, October 17, 2018, where the government makes this announcement saying that it's legal in Canada and the Cannabis Act is in force. And all that time, of course, there was absolutely no supply really available to medical patients, chemo patients, or any other patient. So let's move a little ahead here. So what, so what are we really talking about here? All right, why is cannabis not actually legal for patients? When all of these case after case after court case, well, let's talk about that. It's because it's policy by this government. It's not because it's the will of the people. It's not because it's the will of the sick. It's partly because the government hasn't bothered to do a federal disability act like almost every other country has done already, including the, the, the slow United States of America, which did finally create the Americans with Disabilities Act and the anti-discrimination provision. But guess what? Canada has been getting lip service especially by the latest, Justin Trudeau, about a, a Canadian with Disability Act since about 2014. And nothing has happened once again in that. So obviously, why would medical cannabis be available when there's not even protection or rights for disabled people federally whatsoever? So it goes hand in hand, kind of, doesn't it? Anyway, I wanted to talk about something that I think is really important. And this is something that like, Programs that are being harassed, that are trying to give patients low-cost or no-cost cannabis, which there are such a thing, if you can believe it, out there struggling to try to help people who really have no other option and are not going to be able to get it themselves. And I want to talk about, you know, really what, what they're doing and how the law really looks at it according to court cases. So I want to start with a real important case called Rodriguez versus British Columbia AG 1993 Canley 75 SCC Supreme Court of Canada in which a case in which a, a dying woman was asking for permission legally with her doctor to allow her assisted suicide to end her immense suffering pain she was going through and as you can imagine, well, you know, she ended up passing away before actually winning that case. But let's talk about what the court recognized in that case. And I'm going to quote it here. A criminal sanction applied to another who would assist an individual in a fundamental choice affecting his or her personal autonomy can constitute 
an interference with that individual's security of person. Hmm. And thus, the current law, the Cannabis Act, is unconstitutional because it's interfering with any individuals that are trying to make it available to patients, even terminally ill patients. And that was decided in 1993 by the Supreme Court of Canada and Rodriguez, that principle. Let's go on a little bit further, shall we? Because I think another part that we're missing here, hmm, why, 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 oh, sorry, I went too far there. So Rodriguez was super important, but there's another case that maybe you guys aren't aware of that's really why we're medical marijuana is legal in Canada, but for some reason, it's not being talked about. Oh, there, are, there it is, sorry. And that's the R versus Morgenthaler case, 1988, Canley 90, Supreme Court of Canada, all right? And also even refers to Big M Drug Mart case, okay? Also Supreme Court Regina 30, Supreme Court of Canada. So it's, uh, and it, they found, accused persons have standing to challenge the constitutionality of a law they are charged under. Even if alleged unconstitutional effects are not directed at them. R versus Morgenthaler. Nor need accused persons show that all possible remedies for the constitutional deficiency will, as a matter of course, end the charges against them. In cases where a claimant challenges a law by arguing that the law's impact on other persons is inconsistent with the Charter. It is always possible that a remedy under Section 52 of the Constitution will not touch on the claimant's own situation. So where do we know this has happened? Well, it's happened in many cannabis situations and other drug situations such as the Insight Court Order, the Van Du Court Order, and the Holy Smoke Court Order, and eventually the Cannabis Substitution Project's Court Order. Because this is the truth of what is going on in Canada. And if you are out of the loop, or if you're believing that Canada is somehow leading the way in in legalization, or its, its governments or its policies have created a a guidebook or a model for other countries to follow, you're being fooled. You're being hoodwinked. You're being hornswoggled. That's not true. That's simply a lie. Cannabis prohibition and other medicinal plant prohibitions are alive and well in Canada. And people that need the most are having to get court orders to access them and on a case by case basis because we get a bunch of orders for us and the government makes another act going as far back as they can go and we have to start from beginning again to reconstitutionalize these sections of these new programs or regulations or policies that they continue to throw at us here in Canada. You know what? I'm going to move ahead to one little bit because I'm sure the general public around the world are curious about Canada's legal cannabis program. So that's this Cannabis Act. And it basically says that any non-medical cannabis, so that means cannabis that has absolutely no medical value, including no vitamins, minerals, and that has been radiated so it can't really work medically on anyone, no other kind is available or is legal. So buying cannabis from the, these stores, and Canada has saturated 
these markets, you know, they made such a big deal about can't, these stores can't be closed and they have saturated. There are more cannabis stores than liquor stores now. There is, and it's all the same kind of cannabis grown with radiation all through it, grown without any medical input, any spiritual input, any cannabinology input. Just people that are trying to get a paycheck for people that are trying to obviously profit off of those people's sort of slave labor because that's what they're paying people in the cannabis industry in Canada. Slave labor so they won't get any qualified people even at any level. They're all people with basic degrees. So four years somewhere, maybe another two somewhere else. No PhD in cannabis, of course. And now they're in charge and making sick figures growing weed that'll be destroyed year after year after year. Because when you don't know what you're doing and you don't have the right energy and the right abilities and for the right intention, it will be just a plant that comes out. It won't be medical cannabis or even recreational cannabis. It'll be just some plants that have managed to make it to crop. And then, because if you really... If there was really quality assurance going on, they would have involved us legacy people that have been doing this, that have been court ordered legal for decades and decades. They would have brought us in instead of what do they do to us? Right. They have targeted and charged anyone who's medical. What do, you, what do I mean by that? Well, let's go back to the beginning. When we applied for our Section 56s right in the beginning, which had no gram limits or plant counts, any of that silliness, because why would anyone who's terminally ill have to worry about counting their grams and growing? It shows that they are thinking about dollars and cents, not lives and feelings. They are completely lost. Their desire to put, for example, the Minister of Marijuana decision, Right? Or now he's the Minister of Cannabis. Oh, right. I was called the Minister of Marijuana in 2000, February 28, 2000, actually, by the media for being at Health Canada's first workshop. Hmm. Strange as that is, because they knew about me and a bunch of other uh, rest of us trying to get our exemptions, they showed up all around Canada and arrested and charged us. Me specifically. And their reason for charging me, well, because I applied for an exemption. Therefore, I shouldn't be using cannabis until my exemption arrives. And that was their official argument before the court. As dumb as that sounds to anyone with a brain, that's drug policy in Canada. And that is the same policy going on today. Why can't they do it to someone like me? Because I won my court order. A judge looked at the evidence and saw what I was doing was reasonable and what they're doing wasn't and even gave me damages and returned my stuff and my grow equipment and everything just to make an example of them. So they can't come after me, people like me for cannabis. So what do they do? Canada is one of the last countries that goes after patients because they're sick. Who would have thought you can be charged and jailed for life because you have a terminal illness. Ah, would Terry Fox roll over in his grave or what? I don't know. This is kind of the, the stupidity of not having a national Canadians with Disabilities Act. They can choose to ruin people's lives. And of course, once they put that terminal ill person in jail, God, their terminal illness comes on, comes up pretty damn quick because they don't access their meds, they don't get proper food. And so whatever they were terminally ill with the timeline, the government of Canada has shrunk that right down. Again, why don't they just allow the assisted suicide when they walk in the door? Oh, because they can't bill their 100000 a year per bed per inmate that they make in their correction business, right? It's all about business, right? As long as we're okay with business, we're going to be okay with this stuff. To wrap things up, if anyone has any questions, I would love to give you the, the, the nitty-ditty on the cases where people have already started to get damages against the government for coming after them for medical marijuana. And uh, 
one of the cases I was just reading to you from was the R versus Howell case, H-O-W-E-L-L, Court of Queen's Bench, Alberta. Look that one up because I think if the knowledge gets out there, I think we could probably stop a little bit of this full-time work they're doing in the drug war. Because you take away the drug war, you take away alcoholism, what would police actually do? Think about it. God bless.